This episode of Cinema of Meaning is sponsored by Mubi. Go to mubi.com slash cinema of meaning for your 30-day extended free trial. Hello and welcome to Cinema of Meaning, the podcast from myself, Thomas Flight, and my fellow video essayist, Tom Vanderlinden from the channel Like Stories of Old, where we seek to explore the depths of what cinema has to offer. This week, we're going to be talking about David Fincher's 2010 neoclassic, The Social Network. Before we jump into that discussion, I want to mention that this podcast is a Nebula original, which means if you listen on Nebula, if you're a Nebula subscriber, you get these episodes an entire week early and without any ads or sponsors or anything like that. You also get access to a bonus episode that we do every month. Recently, we talked about David Fincher's Fight Club as a bonus episode, so if you enjoyed this discussion, you might like that one as well. You can sign up for Nebula using the link in the description or by going to nebula.tv slash cinema of meaning. But let's get into this discussion. This is, I think, I called it kind of a, a classic. It's it's one of these, like, mm-hmm. best films of... I think it's like a defining film for that kind of, like, 2000 era or early early social media era i think right yeah it's one that gets referenced a lot there's you know the film bros the nolan guys the fincher people all really like this movie i mean it it won some oscars i think it's it it was fairly popular at the time that it came out well received i enjoyed it i've seen it a couple times but i think it's an interesting movie especially now to kind of revisit be, one because it's 13 years old my wife and yeah. i watched it last night and we were just like t- talking about that and like that seems crazy to me that this movie is like uh over or like over time, 12 years yeah. old now <laughs> um but in that time a lot about how we think about facebook social media the internet has kind of changed i think our actual public perception of Mark Zuckerberg is maybe not different, but we have we've seen a lot more of him actually kind of in the public eye than we had at the time when this movie came out. So a lot of the context kind of surrounding the subject matter that this movie is dealing with has changed in the 13 years since it came out. I think it's just a good movie maybe to examine and talk about, but then also I'm interested in kind of revisiting it and looking at maybe how it comes across now in 2023 mm-hmm. versus 2010. Do you have any any opening thoughts that you want to you want to add to that before we start trying to crack this one open? I was thinking about that I maybe have only seen this film once. In my memory I've seen it like like when I think of the social network I think of like oh I've seen that movie a bunch of times but then when I really think about it I like wait I, did I only see this movie one time when it came out? Right. I think the reason it feels like I've seen it more and I still when I watched it earlier today, it feels like I still remember so much of it more than any other movie that's uh, 13 years old or more than the average movie, I'd say, that that's 13 years old. Is um, I think it's because it's been talked about so much in video essays and that I felt like I've just watched it all over, over and over again through commentaries and breakdowns and yeah. these really in-depth scene analyses, which you'll find a lot of with this movie in particular, where... You know, I think it also came out just before the video essay became a thing, really. Right. Uh, right. I don't remember. I don't have the exact timeline in my mind, but I do remember like all the sort the, the sort of first first wave video essayists, uh, Nerd Rider, Every Frame of Painting, Tony Joe, uh, yeah, yeah, Lessons from the Screenplay. I think they they all have videos on the social network that I've yeah, yeah. all seen also. So I feel like I, I think I've just relived this movie so much, ironically, <laughs> yeah. through the internet instead of watching <laughs> yeah. it, by, <laughs> instead of by actually watching the movie over and over. But yeah, I watched it this morning again, really enjoyed it. It's still such a well-crafted film. I think David Fincher is really someone who has mastered this kind of storytelling that's just... I want to say like it's immune to aging in a way like his camera movements are very slick his uh, sensibilities with regards to editing and music it's all very catchy and fast-paced in a way that I 
don't think it's going to feel dated anytime soon. So yeah, that that's my first impression. It's still just a very enjoyable film, just from a uh, craftsmanship's point of view. I also really enjoy the, uh, it's also much talked about the Aaron Sorkin screenplay type writing, where it's right. very much, of the or a lot of the conflict is very uh, dialogue driven, and where he, it almost feels like you have this, just a dialogue scene, and for some reason it feels as intense as an action scene, or uh, a scene with violence, or like any real uh, uh, physical violence. That's something I just really admire about this film and um, about Sorkin's writing in general, where you have these conversations that start in, in, in one place, kind of innocent, I'd say, and then they slowly ramp up like the tension and then they crescendo into this big blowout, often with like cutting back and forth between these montages or other situations and back and forth in time. And yeah, he just has a way of, tying all these things together to make a very talky movie feel v really vibrant and energized. And uh, right. yeah, that's something that just, uh, especially in combination with Fincher's filmmaking uh, philosophy, I think that's just a really solid combination where, it, where you can have a, a, a movie like this that on the page could feel like a, somewhat simple drama or maybe even like a slow uh, dialogue heavy film but then somehow it just feels so engaging that you're not bored even for like one second so yeah, yeah that's something i really enjoyed but at the same time it also feels there 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 is a part of it that feels somewhat quaint now with just the whole depiction of the early this very early phase of social media and <laughs> Yeah, uh, the Facebook and uh, it's kind of that thing where you any movie that deals with technology has this, or any story that deals with technology has this this element of aging. That where I was thinking of like this scene from Friends, the sitcom, where Chandler was presenting his new computer, and it's like by today's standards, like the specs are totally ridiculous. <laughs> and there's a small element of that in the social network, but. I think the movie in itself doesn't feel dated because the story is not about the actual technology itself. It's more about the the figures involved in in that early tech scene, yeah, what that yeah. time was like, the creation of a platform like this, um, sort of the rogue nature of how a lot of these social media businesses were created. Mm -hmm. It captures some of that. Watching it now, the movie feels surprisingly not about Facebook. I think like especially given maybe the context of, there's a really interesting article, um, and I don't want to get into this completely yet, but there's a really mm. interesting article in Vanity Fair written by uh, Sonia Soraya called The Social Network Got Facebook and Zuckerberg All Wrong. And I don't know if it got it all wrong, but like mm. I think a lot of her premise is interesting, which essentially she's talking about the fact that the movie in 2010 can't really see any of the the real problems that would like come out of Facebook. Like in 2010, we still had yeah, a very yeah. naive view of social media where, and we see this kind of reflected in the movie where like the way it's the downsides of social media are kind of depicted as like, Oh, this is just going to be kind of clicky, like, like about exclusivity mm -hmm. yeah. and people will obsess over likes and it's so addicting and God um, forbid they'll be you know, advertised. <laughs> right, there will be advertising yeah. and we'll just kind of like, maybe it'll objectify women, you know, or like pe make, cause people to obsess over relationships. And it's like that stuff literally it does feel quaint when you're like, oh no, 10 years, a decade later, the actual problems that arose out of Facebook mm. were more like, it's destroying all of our, like, <laughs> it's literally like interfering with democracy potentially, yeah, yeah. or like it's, our information is getting stolen and used for nefarious purposes or spreading in misinformation or all these things. And it's, so it's like, the movie doesn't have any of that knowledge or context. And so it really doesn't feel like it's about the thing that we know now that is Facebook. Mm, it yeah. feels much more like it's about, you know, like, 2000s tech culture and 
the people involved at this time, which I think is still like informative about what, you know, maybe some of the conditions that led to something like Facebook being this monolith that has had kind of an, you know, partially negative impact on the world. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So anyway, I, I bring that up to say you were talking about how like it doesn't feel dated in a in one sense and i think you're correct and it does a really good job of portraying the development of the tech but then in another sense i think like at least to me it feels like it almost it it, it almost inevitably kind of misses the most important thing about facebook in hindsight which is not really like the movie's detriment it's like how you can you couldn't have known it's just like if you were going to make this movie now I feel like it would have to look very different, inevitably. That's pretty much exactly what I was struggling to say, that kind of there's a sort of blissful ignorance to it, that both in the sense that it, uh, because the movie came out in 2010, but it captures events from a couple of years before that. And so I think uh, what it captures is still that, it, it, it feels like it just captured that last bit of reality that wasn't yet completely dominated by online spaces and social media. Right. Like you can see almost where the moment where things went wrong and we <laughs> blissful or like ignorantly headed into the past that we're going on right now and uh, that we are in many ways not too happy with. And and at the same time in 2010, as you said, like the full implications of that weren't yet as obvious as they are now. Um, I right. think that... Uh, in addition to what you said, I think there was also still in those earlier days of social media, there was still a sense that people who were on the internet weren't all the people. Like there was a social media was still more of a literal bubble that you could log off from and then go outside and not have to deal with it as much. But whereas now it feels like everyone is on the internet, everyone's on social media. And even if you choose to like log off and try to avoid it, you'll still be seeing the effects of it now clearly and unmistakably in like the real world around you. There's no more, it's clear now, I think more than in 2010, that there's no more escaping from the social media and whatever uh, right. it has created and whatever implications it has on our individual and collective psyche. And that is kind of that quaintness that I was referring to. That <laughs> yeah, it had yeah. some foresight but it didn't have the full prescience of seeing where this was going it didn't intend to have it it didn't say any much about where this is going it was more of a story looking back to see where it got to where it right. was at that point which i think is fair so that's not a critique of the movie it's just um it's just it, it just makes it somewhat funny maybe to to look right, back yeah, on it yeah. now to see just like oh look how cute they were back then, not knowing what, <laughs> what, what this was going to be or what this was going to turn into. But yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's an interesting dynamic within the film itself because one of the things that I think drives the Zuckerberg character in this movie is this sense th that he has and that Sean Parker kind of shares of like, them being the only ones who truly see kind of like where this thing is headed, like the full potential of this thing. They're kind of like, oh, this is going to be huge. And all these other people around them are kind of doubting that. And so, you know, those characters can be pretty dislikable, but at their core, you have this fundamental thing of like, oh, they get something here, which ended up being true, which is like, mm -hmm. it was this huge world changing thing. Everybody else who doesn't see that in 2010 looked like an like you know ignorant but like especially now you're like uh, can't you see this super obvious like how influential this is going to be in you know our with our yeah, hindsight yeah. being 2020 so i think there's there's an interesting dynamic there too where like looking back i mean it was already a part of it in 2010 being able to look back and be like facebook was huge but like the fact the fact that the movie ends with some kind of like line and it's like, oh, Facebook now has, I think it's like 100 million users or 150. I don't remember what the what the exact mm -hmm. line is, but it's like the the 
Now Facebook has 2.9 billion users. It's like currently in 2023. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I, I think it's maybe even been losing users recently. So we're so far past this point of even the context of sort of everybody's awareness of what this thing is or like the dynamic between the people who don't believe in it and, and the, the mm. characters who do. It kind of just gets like inflated even, even larger yeah. now, I think. Yeah, it it also still feels like it was very much set in a time where there was more of a general discussion on social media with regard, or where we hadn't yet figured out the full pros and cons of social media. Like there was still a more, I think, an even-sided debate where they're right. like, on the one hand, like, oh, look how much it's bringing us together. You can connect with anyone from your past schools or jobs or whatever. So in that sense, it's connecting us. But at the same time, you know, maybe your aunt is now a flat earther. So that's right. maybe it's causing some disconnect <laughs> as well. Or, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> so, but I, th I feel like at that point, there was still a more like, eh, you know, pros and cons, mostly good though. Uh, and that's also how they seem to talk about it in the movie. I think that's, you know, kind of implicitly hidden in the subtext, I feel there's still a sense that Facebook was, for all its flaws, a impressive achievement, which it was, uh, you know, from a right. literal changing the course of history point of view. But uh, yeah. it, it also still felt like it was more from a moral point of view or from a more uh, sociological point of view that it still felt that it was overall a beneficial thing for our society, that it was still something that on the one hand connected to some kind of primal desire for right. uh, that. That's something that the movie touches on early, like with the, the first thing that Mark Zuckerberg makes that kind of comparing different two women and then deciding right, which one is mesh. hotter, like face mesh, yeah. uh, which was juxtaposed with when he was making that app, it was, juxtaposed with all these frat guys inviting all these women over to their party and them um, that all becoming like tangled together as they start using the app and it kind of highlights the sort of misogyny obviously on both sides like both the nerds and the the frat guys they're both objectifying women in their own way but at the same time it also seems to suggest that they just that there is some kind of primal urge there to more of that there's the observation that a lot of our social dynamics are driven by desires and more, you know, to some extent to, of, by lust, but also just by a desire for love, status. Uh, love and status. And that yeah. at some point is also br brought up again with uh, when Facebook introduces that relationship status thing, which Mark presents as like, this is the key, like, no one cares what your hobbies are. They want to, you know, they want to know if they can get laid or get a relationship. They, I think they say both of those things. But when it comes to like uh, judging whether or not Facebook was a good thing, in, in that sense, it does seem to argue that it kind of channels a very basic desire that we have within right. our society that we have collectively uh, or, or that we have these collective social dynamics that are very much driven by these things that we don't always talk about explicitly. And so now we can have this technology to kind of do it for us in a way. You don't have to like convey your relationship status. You can now just click a button and it's done for you. And that makes maybe some of that social friction a little bit easier. Uh, again, I think that's this is what the film seems seem to argue for me, or at least that's what the characters in the film right. promote, which isn't uh, directly, I think, critiqued by the more uh, overarching storytelling. So yeah, that's, I think, where the movie lands on the benefit of social media, that it right. does aid in otherwise awkward or more complicated human interactions. But at the same time, I'm trying to think if, if it also really dives into the potential downsides, even the ones they had in the time, obviously the ones that you mentioned at the beginning, yeah. they weren't really within the realm of perception uh, just yet, I think, uh, at the time. Right. But 
That's where, yeah, that's where I feel like, like I was saying, I think it, it ultimately feels like much more a movie. Like this, would, this movie would be better titled maybe as like the social networker. Uh, that would be actually a bad title, but like it's much more about, or like call it Zuck or something. I don't know, but like it's much more a movie about Mark Zuckerberg. I think ultimately than it is a movie of, and not even like not even necessarily the real Mark Zuckerberg because we might get into like how accurate a depiction of Mark Zuckerberg this actually is, but in terms of dramatically what it's about, I think it's much more a movie about Mark Zuckerberg than it is really about Facebook. Mm-hmm. And to your point, I think like it's not it doesn't feel like it ever really heavily tries to critique what Facebook is itself. If any like the closest thing we get to that is maybe that bit at the end where um Zuckerberg has uh Erica Albrecht's uh page open and she's he's just like refreshing to see if she's accepted his friend request. But it's mm-hmm. but alt and that maybe is like a commentary on the way these platforms could facilitate kind of our obsession over certain social dynamics, but uh, but it feels more like a commentary about Zuckerberg, you know, as a character in this movie and kind of his motivations and how even all this success ultimately hasn't led him to the thing that he wanted in the first place. It's just he's still sort of lonely. Um you know, and maybe you could see a, a commentary in there that like Facebook as a platform, at least for this one character, isn't really bringing him closer to other people. You know, he's still as, yeah, yeah. you know, disconnected and unable to, uh, you know, deal with the people around him as he was bef- before, potentially. I don't know. Um, but yeah, to me, it just feels like it's much more yeah. ab- about him and his motivations and trying to critique that than really was the platform. Yeah, I think that's true. I I think it's also a, that's where a lot of the real life irony comes back. Where right, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I remember there was a lot of talk about uh, Mark Zuckerberg being the socially awkward guy who then makes the network that brings everyone together. Like there's there's a tension yeah. there that perhaps is suggestive of that maybe Facebook wasn't the end of history when it comes to social media and bringing us all together in a unified network that's all beneficial and that doesn't have any problems at all. But yeah, I I agree that this is mostly a story of Zuckerberg and also more specifically the Zuckerberg as a character, not so much a real life person. I think they took quite a few liberties when making this movie. Yeah, the the biggest being like allegedly or according to various sources he already knew his wife in 2003 kind of when this movie starts so the whole like Mm. idea that he's set up this website to try to apparently he did write a blog post uh, a negative blog post about a woman but it's like unconfirmed whether or not he was dating her or not so this whole like central conceit of the film that he's kind of like built this thing to get back at his ex and also, you know, is trying to like reconnect with her is kind of has no substantiation in, in, uh, in reality. Yeah. That's probably also the part of the movie that feels the most movie ish kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Citizen Kane, the sort of (laughs) rosebud element where the character has this one secret hidden motivation that isn't resolved at the end. And that makes the whole, rise to success feel somewhat empty at the end of it that all feels more like that's the more the sort of shakespearean sauce over the real life history which also i think is part of the uh what i think is also like an interesting tension here between whether or not zuckerberg comes out of this uh, and maybe also just the story that he represents the kind of rags to riches uh the, the rebel nerd to super billionaire, how does he come out of this as a good or a bad character, essentially? Like, is he supposed right. to be an inspiration or a cautionary tale? Because I think there's also the same, sort of the same with Fight Club. I think there's some mixed signaling there where there is yeah. a critique in the text, but that also one that's easily ignored and often willfully or 
incidentally just ignored by those who kind of cherry pick what they want to take away from a movie like this. Um, there was an, uh, a really interesting video that I saw not too long ago. I think it was from the channel um, Broey Deschanel, who did a video mm -hmm. on uh, yeah, yeah. the social network uh, and how we look back on it now, knowing that Mark Zuckerberg isn't exactly the cool guy <laughs> entrepreneur right. that we should all <laughs> yeah. aspire to be. And also how the, the movie seems to have this internal conflict where maybe Sorkin, the writer, wanted to portray him more critically, but uh, whereas Fincher looked at him as more of a inspirational figure and who saw in him a sort of rebelistic, is that a word, rebelistic? A, a rebel, rebel artist. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like himself, maybe, or you saw something of himself in that, you know, the right. just the, the, the renegade creative who goes against the establishment which is very well presented here by these Finkelfoss twins who represent these very stuffy rich uh we're men of harvard type dudes yes. who try try to get in this way but uh you know and compared to that and you have mark zuckerberg in his flip-flops and his uh, bathrobe right. and he feels like the true underdog and so there's it, you know, in the storytelling language, it, it's very easy to root for Mark in this context. And I think that's also what Fincher seemed to have won us to do. Uh, I think he may have been like neutral about it, but, you know, inadvertently, maybe he does portray him as a sort of more of a rocky figure than uh, someone who is truly a more of that Citizen Kane uh, type character right. who's more of a yeah. cautionary tale from the from the very beginning. I wrote in my notes just two punk question mark because like I think you know that it balances a little it a little bit where I think Fincher is genuinely depicting an element of the tragedy especially between Mark and Eduardo and kind of that lawsuit he shows as being sort of this that's where I think he Mark comes across more as at fault and there's there's a, an element of tragedy there but mm -hmm. in his struggle against the Winklevi, you have, you know, he's making these like quips at the at the uh, prosecuting attorneys or the, the the legal counsel, and he's, you know, he's kind of the punk who who did all the work himself and sees the real value and potential in these things, and he's going up against the man, which is represented by these rich, you know, privileged white boys who are just like. You know, oh we, it would, oh we had yeah, the idea for the Harvard Connect or whatever. Yeah, very entitled and mm -hmm. so like, and I think the way some of that is um, conveyed does like does come across as kind of like, yeah, this kind of punk character where Hannah and I were talking about this and saying like. Uh, she was saying, and I agree, that mm, I think I was much more sympathetic to Mark like the first time I watched this in 2010. And I don't mm -hmm. know how much of that is like my personal values have probably changed to some extent over its, the last decade. So I see his behavior as a little bit more problematic than now than I would have a decade ago. But also, you know, also we know more of the negative downsides of Facebook. So that colors things a little bit. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's like the... The very end note, not to jump too far ahead, but that little end note where I forget her name, but the the uh, law assistant pre law, oh, yeah. or um, she's like, "You're not an asshole, Mark. You're just you're just trying so hard to be one." Like I think maybe the first time I watched that, I would have been like, "Oh yeah, that makes sense," or I would have bought that line a little bit. And for me, this time around, that line kind of falls a little flat, and I'm not sure exactly mm -hmm. why, but like. I'm like I didn't I didn't know if I bought it like this yeah. time around. It it feels like that last second absolvement of his actions or you know because the movie opens with him being broken up with by uh, Rooney Mara's character who then famously says or it's become one of the most iconic lines I think of the movie and uh one that's brought up in a lot when talking about screenwriting in general is that when that she sort of ends the, the conversation with that 
you know, I'm sure you're going to do great and successful things. And, uh, but I want you to know that when girls don't want to be with you or women don't like you, it's not because you're a nerd, it's because you're an asshole. Right. And <laughs> he says that with such great directness that, yeah, which really sets the tone for his character and for the audience as well because now you're in you have it in your mind like there's a facade here of this nerdy character but there's also the realization or at least the sort of kind of the idea that's sort of incepted in your mind that he's beneath it all there's just an asshole as she states right right and so when you look when you see that uh the whole scene that follows with the the face smash it was called that's also mm -hmm. when I think for me as the audience, that's when you connect more with her side of the story. Like, oh yeah, you can see like, oh yeah, he's just a, he's just a jerk beneath it all. You know, he's not really, there is a sort, sort of an angry person in there that's hiding beneath or maybe even hiding behind his social awkwardness. Um, and so, yeah, that to have that being sort of backtracked at the end a little bit of, or, um, undermined a little bit at the end with that line, oh, you're not, you know, it's fine, you're not really an asshole, you're just trying to be one. Uh, I'm not sure even what she specifically means by that, even in the context of the story, that I didn't feel like he was going out of his way to be perceived as an asshole or to be jerky. I, I feel like he's... He, did try to, yeah. you know, he, he felt very non-confrontational, I think, throughout the movie. He did make that sneaky move towards Eduardo, of course, but at the same time, you know, Eduardo also made his own mistake of not even looking at the, the documents that became his own right. death certificate, as he puts it. And there's that whole part where after Mark meets Sean Parker, Justin Timberlake's character, that he visibly becomes enamored by that lifestyle that he does want like it, right you know he's tasted that high life and that you can see that there's a part of him that wants to have that who wants to be a man of status a man who gets all the women who hey, he goes to all these parties who's the life of the party or at least the most important person at the party and there's definitely a sense that he wants that but i didn't get the sense that he specifically wants to be an asshole like it's not like he started out right as this nice guy who then falls into this life of success and then starts treating everyone like shit like now because because that because that's what he feels like it means to be a person in that lifestyle um so so yeah that that line's always confused me a little bit and still does i guess yeah this episode was brought to you by Mubi the curated streaming service showing hand-picked exceptional films from around the globe which both Thomas and I have been big fans of for many, many years. Today I want to recommend a film that I really enjoyed. One of my favorite actresses is Tilda Swinton, and there's a great movie from 1992 directed by Sally Porter called Orlando. It's this really strange film that kind of jumps through time and history, and it's, it's really hard to describe, but Tilda Swinton plays a single character that kind of morphs throughout time. I don't think I've seen any other movie like it, but it's available on Mubi now in the U.S. The great thing about Mubi, though, is that their library is really well curated. So even if you don't like my recommendation, it's a great place to go to just look for interesting stuff to watch. Every movie comes with an explanation for why it's worth checking out, and they're constantly adding to and updating the library. Yeah, they also have these interesting curated series and specials where you can go into these sort of lists that are focused on like one theme or a director or an era so that you can not just have like one movie but you can also dive into like a whole subgenre or someone's body of work and it, for me it's it's been a great way to sort of navigate these varying canals of cinema in yeah. a in a very entertaining way yeah but yeah you can get a 30-day extended free trial with our link that's movie.com slash cinema of meaning which you can also find in the show notes. Be sure to check that out and start your free month of great cinema today. That's movie.com slash cinema of meaning. Now let's get back to the podcast. I think while we're on this kind of discussion of the depiction of him as punk, I think one of the interesting things is 
you know, how we've been, we've been exposed to the real Mark Zuckerberg a little bit more. And he, yeah. he doesn't have any of the like Jesse Eisenberg sort of just like wit or charisma that comes across here. Um, or I, maybe charisma is the wrong word, but like even in this, like he's depicted in a negative light, I think in this film, but there's also, mm -hmm. there's also that tiny little bit that we've already talked about where you're kind of like, you know, there's almost this like Tyler Durden-esque, like kind of like coolness to how that comes yeah. across and like real life Zuckerberg does not, <laughs> does not have this quality at all, uh, which makes this depiction kind of hilarious in some regards, like looking back on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I wonder to what extent that also undermines the movie as a critique of Zuckerberg and his endeavors because looking yeah, yeah. at this movie you can get the sensation that they made stuff up you know I mentioned the the Rooney Mara stuff the, the, the sort of rosebud element feels yeah. very movie-ish and then when you learn there's a lot of other details that might have may have been altered or embellished or whatever so that makes it easier, I think, for an, an audience member to look at this movie and then only see the general structure, the sort of rebellious rise to power, because that's, you know, that's what people who don't know anything about soccer, they, they do know that that's what happened in real life. He built Facebook from the ground up, uh, had the, the, most of these lawsuits were real. So I think people assume like that the critical parts in the movie or the... Let me put it like this. I think it's easy to assume that the critical parts in this movie are made up, whereas the more inspirational aspect or the more favorable depictions of Mark Zuckerberg are easier to embrace as truth. And so that's, yeah. I think, also a part of the tension here, specifically coming on top of David Fincher's, uh, the, the kind of conflicted storytelling he can sometimes uh, have, as we talked about with. Fight Club, but, you know, Fight Club wasn't based on a true story, so that didn't have to deal with right. that, but the social network does. So, yeah, I think that that's also an interesting element to consider when you talk about the way people look at, or the way people interpret this story as uh, inspirational or as critical of Zuckerberg, that they kind of cherry pick the elements that they see or that they perceive as being the the quote-unquote real elements and then ignore the more critical parts that can easily be uh, brushed aside as a additional fiction to the real story. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of, one of the things the movie does get right, I think, is at least in depicting just kind of the atmosphere of carelessness out of which the is this... Facebook was created essentially mm -hmm. like that there was not any care or attention to kind of the impact it would have on its users or whether or not it was a good thing. It was just like, oh, this is successful. People want this. People want to be a part of this. How can we spread this all around the world as, uh, as fast as possible? Um, kind of related to that, one thing I, I, we've kind of danced around this topic, I think a little bit, but one thing I wanted to ask you about is they make a little bit of a thing out of kind of this idea that Zuckerberg is not driven by money. Like he doesn't really care about mm. the money. This is what Eduardo says a couple of times. I think that kind of leaves this, I can kind of believe that that's maybe true about the real Zuckerberg to some degree, but that kind of mm -hmm. leaves this question in both the movie and in reality of like, what is the driving force here? Like, what is he just looking for? It's a movie is like, oh, well, he wants to actually just be with Erica Albrecht or, or Albright or whatever, whatever her name was, Rooney Mara's character. Kind of, you know, status is thrown out there, but like yeah, his yeah. character is still a little bit of an, an enigma in these regards in terms of like, what is it that's actually driving this is there just a passion about the thing itself um the numbers like you know are those numbers inherently meaningful to him just like i think that's mm -hmm. maybe what we see a little bit in you know kind of the excitement he sees along w when he becomes enamored with like what sean parker the ethos that sean parker presents where it's like oh you know uh, sean parker's like i don't care about the money i just 
quote unquote brought down the record companies, which uh, he didn't also, which is yeah, funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, I just wondered if you had any thoughts about like his motivation specifically there and how that relates yeah. to like how much he is or isn't caring about the money side of things. Yeah, he definitely doesn't explicitly state it as you'd often see in other similar movies like the the Steve Jobs, uh, Steve Jobs movies, for example, there's a more explicit mission statement from the Jobs character or, you know, Steve Jobs. Um, I think, yeah, it, it, it's it's mostly what we already talked about, maybe the, the sort of rosebud that's given here, the desire for status, but not just status as in social status as in a place on the social hierarchy, but also just um, in more in the personal minds of the people who are around him, like uh, Erica's character, maybe some of the other students that look down on him or uh, didn't want to be friends with him or didn't want him in his, um, that, uh, what are the names of those kind of student organizations again? The final clubs? Final clubs. Final yeah. clubs. I'm not sure. I think it at least it starts with that. Be, he, because the thing is, he's kind of presented as this very reactionary character. Like he starts face mash after being pissed off by his breakup. And then he starts right. the Facebook by being pissed off allegedly by be, for not be, being uh, invited to the finals club. So it feels like that there's no internal motivation as much as there's a just a reflex towards things happening around him, which maybe is what drives uh, or, or what um, is part of that emptiness that he feels at the end or that he seems to feel at the end that there's that you kind of realize there may be no strong innate driving force, but more like that sense of anger that's just him lashing out at bad things that happen to him or at least in his perceptions by... Uh, the world around him but yeah he doesn't seem to care much about money um at the same time he does need it he's also pretty forward in just asking it eduardo for money when he needs to and uh doesn't seem all too grateful for it so i feel like he doesn't need money mostly because he knows he has some access to it when he needs to which obviously becomes his literal sort of lifestyle when he is this Facebook billionaire who has all the money in the world and he literally doesn't have to think about it because he just has it already. And I think that's also what he points out in one of the hearings that he's no longer interested in the finals club because he can now buy the entire street and buy the house if right. he wants to. I'm not sure if there's more to dig into there. There's a sense in which the way the movie de depicts it, it almost feels like, you know, it's depicting him as being a skilled programmer hmm. and having a certain drive and vision, but it also depicts him a little bit as just kind of lucking upon this thing that is very successful and then just, you know, riding that success as kind of being, you know, the driving motivation above yeah. everything else. And I think, you know, that, that in terms of, I think, kind of the movie leveling a critique, you know, it's maybe buried a little bit, but I think that's a pretty legitimate critique of kind of what maybe is part of the problem with, with the real Facebook at the core is like, you know, the thing driving Facebook is, Hey, let's be successful. Let's have us get as many people's attention be in as, you know, have as many users as possible, um, generate as many advertising dollars as we can and those are the, you know, defining priorities of the platform and yeah, yeah. all the downsides that we can now see a decade after this movie, you know, are kind of the fallout of that sort of blind prioritization of success at, on along these certain metrics at any cost. So, you mm -hmm. know, you can kind of see the seeds here of the, the, the sort of company culture maybe that led to the problems that we can see now, um, even if it's not aware of those directly or critiquing those directly. Um, 
But yeah. I don't know how much of that is actually in the movie and how much of that is just in like the actual factual details of how Facebook was started. And so, you know, mm -hmm. you see it in the movie because yeah, it's there in real life and they're not skewing the story to such a great extent that, you know, you completely lose the information about, you know, the context of how the yeah, actual yeah. platform was started. Yeah, I'll, I'll add one more thing to what I was saying about Mark's motivation. I think... Uh, one thing I, I was just thinking of is that his that that reactionariness that I was talking about is also sort of present there after he meets Sean Parker and he gets a taste of like I don't I'm not just able to get revenge on one girl or one finals club that didn't want me I can now take on the entire industry maybe even the entire uh, at least that maybe at the beginning all the the entire university the entire country like all the universities in the country and then later maybe even the the, the planet as a whole as a, some sort of i feel like that that's more elon musk's thing right now where he kind of feels just somewhat salty and somewhat uh, vindictive to the world and just seems to be lashing out to some extent or just like causing chaos just for his own entertainment and because he knows he has the power position to do so. The movie seems to present that as an element there, that Mark becomes enamored by that potential to really upset the status quo. And um, But that's also the part I think that's mostly perceived as a positive element, that idea that we're these rebels, we're going to upset the entire order and we're going to do something new, we're going to revolutionize. And that's you know part of the, the, the cool aspect of this whole story yeah. um but in addition to also what you were saying i i don't feel like that is as strongly that that whole business culture of the, the sort of silicon valley ideology and i think um there's a lot of the idea that there that this that we need technological process progress for its own sake or it feels like they're looking for the, the inventing solutions for problems that aren't even identified in that sense. Right, right, but I feel yeah. like, you know, a, a show like Silicon Valley does that, addresses that much more specifically where you, uh, which is a great, I think, a great combo to watch with the social network. That's true, and yes. Watch, yeah. uh, have you seen it? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I hadn't thought about it in a while, but I watched it as it was airing. And yeah. um, that's, I, I, a, that's a great critiques a lot of the things that were that this movie kind of you know was too early to yeah to have a handle on i think yeah i feel like that show more explicitly and more effectively displays that the ideology that is present there that kind of we want to make the world better we're going to bring everyone together and kind of reveal that for just being a front for we want to make a lot of money or we want to have this power position and then um also the idea like we don't even want to solve like any global problems we're just gonna we just want to make progress because that's what we do right this uh, we don't want to stand still we need to have everything needs to be an app everything needs to be this or that and i feel like that that's something that this movie may have been or the social network then it may have come out a little bit too early to really dive into that broader philosophy because it's also not really depicted as much you know silicon valley is mentioned here but it's not really i don't think it's even literally shown it's just we just see the house that they rented and there's kind of that sort of frat guy ish culture there you know the, the mm -hmm. guy sitting in the dilapidated family home drinking beer breaking things up and uh, that's also Coding. what you see in, in Silicon Valley, you know, yeah. these incubators where uh, the, these families, the family homes are now transformed into this space where the next big thing is going to be born from. But that broader culture is not really addressed that much, I think, in, in this movie. Um, not a critique necessarily of the film. I think it's just uh, may have been out of or beyond uh, what this movie was reaching for and uh, what it was trying to do. But, you know. Yeah. I had, in speaking of this movie being kind of like maybe something that some people latched onto as kind of inspiration, um, 
I was thinking about kind of the mythos of Silicon Valley and mm-hmm. just that whole like uh, that whole culture and how this movie might have done more to kind of uh, maybe it was less of a critique ultimately and more of just like a kind of a myth of that culture in a sense for a certain group of people potentially yeah, yeah. where, you know, that whole line of like, you know, that Sean pa- Parker line where he's like, you know, what's cool. They're talking about whether or not to put advertising on it. And they're like, advertising's not cool. What's cool is a billion dollars or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I'm butchering the line, but that's the general that premise. A million dollars is cool. You know what's cool? Yeah. It's billion $2 billion. Dollars. <laughs> Or a billion dollars. Yeah. Well, it's $3 billion. Why not? But the insinuation there was that if they do advertising and they're going to sell out and then it will be a million dollar yeah. bank. But that's not fun. You know what's fun? Building towards a billion dollar idea. But that's like a real technique that to this day, like social media, like new social networks employ where it's like Instagram as it was coming up no advertising and it was like a very cool hip place to be it was a great experience mm-hmm. and there's this game there's this playbook essentially that's established of uh you know building up a user base and then dropping advertising on there you go on instagram now and it's just this like it's like 60 percent advertising it feels yeah. like Facebook too, ironically. <laughs> Facebook too, you know, TikTok evolved in the same way. A lot of these platforms do that. Now, interestingly, in some places, there's almost a reaction against that where it's saying, hey, instead of building things with advertising, we, we want to try to establish like uh, profitability from the beginning, you know, mm-hmm. with subscriptions or something you pay for directly. <clears throat> Nebula. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nebula.tv slash cinema meaning. I'm not saying that dynamic is because of this movie, but I'm just saying like that ethos, if anything, may have been fueled by uh by this movie to some extent. Or people may have seen this as, you know, looked at this movie and been like, oh yeah, maybe, maybe Zuck is a little bit of a is being a little mean. But he's still an icon here of kind of the 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 way to be successful in this world and how you how you would approach doing this. And I wonder if that's starting to break down a little bit now, like to a decade later. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the funny thing is that if this movie were made today, then Zuckerberg would be the status quo that's about to be right, toppled right. by <laughs> yeah, some yeah. new Zuckerberg type character. That's my question is like, does the Zuckerberg type character even still exist in that form? Like Mm. these new, the new things that are arising to replace Instagram, like maybe, maybe, or replace Facebook, maybe Instagram was like that, maybe a few others since then, but the kind of scrappy upstart that starts out in a little house in Silicon Valley that turns into this world changing platform isn't really that much of a thing anymore. It's more like, Oh, we have this huge, uh, Chinese corporation. We have, uh, you know, an Elon Musk funded AI corporation. We have this, Mm -hmm. that, you know, whatever. I think like the space has fundamentally changed. Yeah. I think that there's at least a stronger sense that there's now entrenched powers in the digital space and in the social media space. Whereas, Uh, A decade or so ago, or even longer, it felt like more. It was still more of the Wild West, where it was all wide open. I'm I'm just trying to think of what a movie, uh, if they were to make a movie today about Mark Zuckerberg and covering like, make it like this four-hour epic. Right. uh, Have you seen the movie Giant for by any chance? The Mm. it's a a somewhat lesser-known James Dean movie from. No, no, I haven't. That one also covers this this scrappy dude who um, discovers oil on this land, or that there's oil on his land, and then he becomes this rich baron, I guess. Uh, it's, it's a really long movie, and it's but it also covers that complete journey from um, nobody to like this huge tycoon of industry. Um, and I feel like in, if you compare that to the social network, then it feels like we're only halfway in the story of Mark Zuckerberg right. and the social network ends, you know, you mentioned it as towards the beginning with that this movie ends with Facebook now has 
150 million or so users, you know, barely a fraction of what it, what it is today and what, uh, what social media in general means to us today. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I really have a point to make here, but I'm, I'm just curious, like, or I'm, tr- I'm trying to imagine like what, uh, I, I guess I'm just trying to, to give a visualization of how much the Mark Zuckerberg character has changed in yeah, today's yeah. perception and what it would look like if that story was told now instead of uh, 13 yeah. years ago. Um, yeah, it, it would have to be a very different movie. And I think you're right in the sense that it very much feels like we're still within that story and we don't know what the ending is, which, no. I mean... They knew that in 2010, but I think almost since then, we've entered into this phase where it felt like Facebook would be this huge dominant thing, maybe forever. And then within a few years already passed out of that again into a new thing where we're like, oh no, well, maybe some of these things will die and dwindle. And, you know, in 20 Mm -hmm. years, Facebook might, might barely be, you know, Facebook's own attempt to move into the next big thing creating the metaverse is like horribly failing yeah, you know yeah. it's like if the social network is like chapter one of the story in like if realistically this this story when somebody make tells the whole story again in like you know another five or ten years it, it won't be a it'll be like a show it'll mm-hmm. be a mini series or something it won't be a movie and and like the the quippy witty mark zuckerberg in the the lawsuits that we see in this movie will be replaced with the kind of uh awkward mark zuckerberg we saw in like the the congressional trials probably yeah, yeah. and you know and the arc is much more one of like a rise and fall i think that mm-hmm. we'll see yeah so yeah. the this movie might become an artifact of like capturing a very specific moment of this larger story yeah and end of that general myth that you were talking about of this right uh garage to billionaire journey which i think that that's i guess what the point i was trying to make earlier also is that the the journey from 2010 to now for mark zuckerberg i think is even more disillusioning than the kind of critique that they were (laughs) yeah offering in 2010 like you know oh he's this super successful rebel entrepreneur but maybe he was a little sad privately you know that to me doesn't sting as much as he spent him spending the last 10 years or so kind of treading water with these weird projects being called in and out of congressional hearings for potential treason or uh, (laughs) existential (laughs) questions regarding our the nature of our democracy and uh, having him having to answer basically for psychic damage to <laughs> right. the, the world's population, you know, you know, above all, like moral issues aside, it just, to me, it, at least it doesn't seem fun anymore to be that kind of billionaire. Like if I, I, if I look at what Mark Zuckerberg's life is like now, like that's absolutely not aspirational to me. I I wouldn't want to trade right. places with him at all. You know, the guy has no private life. He's just, constantly bombarded, uh, completely divorced from reality, probably. At least he's not turned as clownish as Elon Musk has recently. But actually, I don't know, maybe I, I, I don't really, I haven't really seen that much of Mark Zuckerberg on the internet or like, I, I think I've seen like two interviews with him and one metaverse clip that was just completely silly. But yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like there's today more than ever a sort of, realization that being on top of the game like that is not necessarily a fun or ideal place to be and it doesn't definitely now that all these billionaires are on twitter and stuff you know it's clear that it's not good for your own personal sanity i think that's right right even more like disillusioning than what the uh, what any critique in 2010 was capable of offering uh, on these types of characters and the kind of associated mythos that um, so that that uh, surrounds it. Recommendations for a movie to watch after having enjoyed and being fascinated by the social network. By the social network, yeah. 
I already I, I want to mention Giant again and okay. uh, and Silicon Valley for a more specific critique of the Silicon Valley ideology uh, and the kind of philosophy that's that underpins that. But yeah, Giant is a movie from 1956 directed by George Stevens, starring James Dean, Rock Hudson, Elizabeth Taylor. Yeah, it's, it's three hours and 20 minutes long, but it's it's really good. It's re- like a really solid epic of this uh, rise into fame or rise into power. And then um, also all the while critiquing like what this journey really leads and what this really offers in terms of fulfillment, satisfaction, happiness, so on. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great classic uh not not necessarily western but it, it's it's set in like uh west western states uh i guess where you guys drill for all the oil but yeah uh but yeah classic epic film uh definitely worth the watch that sounds great i have not i wasn't even aware of that one so i'll no. have to uh I'll have to check it out i don't know if i have any good um any brecks better than that i think you know, Silicon Valley is the obvious contender. I definitely recommend this um, this article in Vanity Fair, um, which I will try to remember to link to in the show notes, uh, so you can check that out. Um, Sonia Soraya does a great job of of kind of reading the film through a little bit more of like a feminist critical lens too, and kind of talks about how you know some of the more like how it overlooks, you know, it kind of depicts some of this these elements of its origins and face smash and Facebook's impact on like women distinctly from men um, who make up the majority of its users. Um, But she talks more about some of those details. And then also if you're, I guess one other recommendation I'll make is if for some reason you're listening to this and you're like, you know, Facebook is horrible garbage. uh, (laughs) I'm not aware of this. (laughs) <laughs> you probably have a sense of like, I mean, if you're our age you or younger, you probably either don't use it much anymore or already don't like it that much. But if you want like an actual kind of dive into sort of what some like, like the literal actual critiques of something like Facebook, um, the documentary, The Social Dilemma, which is on Netflix, does oh, yeah. a decent job of actually kind of laying some of that out in an, in an accessible way. Um, so... You know, if you want to know what the like factual reality based critique of kind of uh, the yeah, that's a good so, one. Social media mm-hmm. is um, that one's worth checking out. So I'll recommend that article and and the social dilemma, I guess. And maybe I'll also mention uh, also written by Aaron Sorkin the uh, the the Steve Jobs movie that he wrote. I think that one's just the one that's called Steve Jobs. There was a movie called Jobs with Aston Kutcher, which is pretty bad, but there's also one with Michael Fassbender. Yeah, that's 2015's Steve Jobs, um, starring Michael Fassbender as Steve Jobs, directed by Danny Boyle and written by Aaron Sorkin and Walter Isaacson. It's not as good as The Social Network, I don't think, but it's still, uh, if you enjoy the Aaron Sorkin dialogues as conflicts then that's uh a pretty decent one to watch as well this may this movie really made me want uh uh fincher and sorkin to team up again because Mm. um it's a great combo and um sorkin seems dead set on directing now which is Uh, yeah i guess that's fine if that's what he wants to do but the the combo the combo of him and a really talented director uh, can be a lot of fun. Um, Sorkin and, and Definitely. Fincher get <laughs> can track together. <laughs> All right, that's it for this week. If you enjoyed this episode, you can already check out the next episode on Nebula. Go to nebula.tv slash cinema of meaning to get access to that. Uh, you can also join our Patreon discussion. Let us know what you thought about the social network or other movies maybe that you feel like might deal with social media in more um, in, a, in a way that's more up to date and present. If you have any recommendations for that, I'd be really interested to hear about them. Bill Burnham's eighth grade 
is actually another one that kind of captures from the user's point of view, maybe some of the uh, more of a present critique of social media. Anyway, if you want to chat about any of that or make any of those kinds of recommendations, we have a little bit of a Discord community and you can find the link to how you can join that through our Patreon in the show notes. So that's all for now and we'll talk to you next week.